Wine and Crime contains graphic and explicit content which may not be suitable for some listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Listening to Wine and Crime, the podcast where three friends chug wine, chat true crime, and unleash their worst Minnesotan accents. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, I'm Kenyon. Oh, <laughs> I'm Lucy. <laughs> I'm Amanda. <laughs> Are you prepping that wine, girlfriend? You best believe I've made enough <laughs> a of a fool idea. of myself on these videos <laughs> to learn. Peek behind the curtain. <laughs> she prepped. <laughs> um, all right. Well, before we get to the topic this week, I've got a quick butt plug. We Let's hear it. are not being paid to say this. I just want to genuinely share my love of HBO's new I'll Be Gone in the Dark documentary. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's. it's- so good. Like, I loved the book, and Michelle yeah. McNamara is yeah. a brilliant queen. Queen. Mm-hmm. But the the docuseries, which just launched on HBO as of the day we're recording this, it, the first episode came out yesterday. So we're still in, mm-hmm. like, early stages. Yeah. But it is so beautifully done. It is beautifully done. And you feel, we got a little advanced screening, so we've seen the first three episodes. Mm-hmm. And... You really, like, appreciate Michelle's work even more. Oh, my God. The tenacity of this yeah. bitch. I am, mm-hmm. like, in awe of her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's really oh, well she's done. She's a powerhouse. So good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So check I that out. I cried at different parts. Just oh, saying. yeah. Which time? Yeah. And I'm, like, a stone cold bitch. So. Mm. <laughs> mm, you're kind of a crier about some stuff, though. I, this doesn't yeah. surprise me that much. Lucy's wedding, I just... Quept. You, it bald. was game over. I bawled all day. Okay, anyway. Mm-hmm. So that's my quick butt plug for that. I love it. I love it. All right. So um, this week's episode topic yes. is um, thespian crimes. Oh, this is my moment. <laughs> I've been waiting for this my whole life. We it's will not get into drama in t- kid crimes. We will it get into the is. psychology <laughs> of Amanda in this episode. Yay! <laughs> so the fan picker that has subjected us to this episode. <laughs> is- <laughs> oh, then I'm going to lean in even harder for all the sailing and all the French. Uh, that's true. Actually, My yeah, you've had a rough couple of episodes. Uh huh. Okay. All right. Fair enough. So, uh, the fan picker <laughs> Boob this crimes. week. That was me. <laughs> <laughs> that we all appreciate. We weren't that bad yeah. for sailing. Kenyon's pretty constantly Speak. awful with French. I only got boobs. Yeah. This is your moment to be as obnoxious as possible. Every moment is my moment, but anyway, continue. All right. (laughs) So our very special fan picker is Marcella Lunn. Marcella? Marcella? I don't know. There's a TV show, Marcella. um, Who wants? I think it's Marcella, but Marcella. There's There's no way to know. TV show, Marcella. uh, Wants to shout out their sister Casey or (laughs) Chasey. Or Chasey with Chasey. A pro- pronounced but not added H. <laughs> yep. Whatever the opposite of a silent letter is. Like Marcella mm-hmm. and Chasey. Yeah. 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 So thank you so much. Uh, the Lund sisters. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> I love the Lunds. Loves All me right. Lunds. Let's get right to it. Amanda, what is our wine crime pairing for thespian crimes? Oh, well, allow me to take the stage. Oh, Jesus. Um. <laughs> Here we go. I'm glad I already have mine poured already. <laughs> yeah, I already got my bourbon happening. Yeah, I use my best theatrical projection and enunciation so that everybody knows exactly what I'm talking about from the front of the house seats to all the way at the back of the house. What are some of um, those really annoying, like the the pickled 
unique New Poultry. York. Poultry. Unique like, New many York. Many mumbling mice are making midnight music in the moonlight. Mighty nice. <laughs> are we warmed up? Red la, leather, la, 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 yellow la, la, leather. La. <laughs> Red leather, yellow leather. She sells seashells by the seashore. <laughs> Tip of the tongue. Okay, here we go. Jesus. So today we oh, are drinking. You know a lot of them. I'm yeah, I was in theater so for like drunk. over a decade. <laughs> this I was born in it. We'll get um, to it. So <laughs> today we are drinking Wink's Light and Space Cab Franc, like the spotlights upon the space of the stage. It totally works. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Yeah, you, it does. In, in theater, you think about the lights and the space. Yes. Yeah. It does. The blocking and the choreography and no so does. many other elements. And why? Get off book. Um, before I dive <laughs> into this beautiful light and space cab franc, I want to remind everyone that Wink Wine Club is an essential service. It's an online wine club that delivers wine to your door or your local Walgreens where you also pick up your preparation H Mm -hmm. or your office if you're back to work Mm -hmm. among the living. Or your Midol and dog food like I did today. Mm -hmm. I love when I get a Wink delivery on the same day as a grocery delivery. Mm -hmm. Or they're going to say as your period. (laughs) <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, that too when they <laughs> sink it's really helpful Actually, um, yeah. if you have not checked out Wink before head to trywink.com forward slash gals that's T-R-Y-W-I-N-C dot com forward slash gals if it's your first time ordering you get 20 bucks off your first box and they have a really dope membership where you get membership pricing they can make recommendations for you it's awesome we are all members we've been members for years and i have never regretted it a single time you Mm -hmm. can also gift memberships to others Mm -hmm. when you like have get enough wine that you've been buying you can like earn a box of wine that you are like bottles that you can send to your friends gift it to your husband who lives in the same house as you yeah i mean cheat that system (laughs) I should do that now that William and I live together. Yep. I love this Hell idea. Hell yeah. So uh, put four more bottles in your cart. They take care of the shipping. And one more time, that's trywink.com forward slash gals for 20 bucks off your first box if you are new to their service. So check it out. Light and Space Cab Franc is constructed along minimalist lines, hmm. brilliantly showcasing the <laughs> fine raw materials from Curtis Vineyard in Santa Barbara County. The grapes for this wine are harvested in late October when many, many a theatrical season is just debuting for the year. Then see carbonic fermentation (laughs) under native yeast to really pump up the bright fruit presence. Aging in neutral oak for 18 months completes this non-interventionist vitification process. Unfined, unfiltered, and vegan. Light and space is a true expression of Cabernet Franc. Aromatic red fruit, spice, and a hint of smoke are some of the notes in this complex, nuanced wine. At 13.1% ABV, this is a robust wine with tasting notes of bacon, cherry, clove, and cocoa. It certainly deserves a standing ovation. Oh, I Should've see seen that what you did there. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we clutch our bottles histrionically and pop using our nice pop wine key from our online store, Wine and Crime Podcast at BigCartel.com? Oh, good. The props department supplied you with one. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, though, like literally, because remember, yeah. I lost mine in my move. So the props yeah. department of All Colors LLC did supply yeah. me with that. <laughs> Okay, let us not utter the name Macbeth within this theater and wish broken legs for all. Ooh. Is it real wine or stage wine? It's real wine. I don't fuck with that <laughs> shit. But I am limiting myself to like two glasses because I've been so hungover every time we fucking record that my life is like ending. <laughs> yeah. These Last videos. episode. It was, it was bad. I FaceTimed Lucy afterward and kept drinking. 
Yeah. yeah. It was not good. You guys wanted to keep the call going, and it was like 1 a.m. my time, and I was like, peace. Oh, it was like yeah, 4 or 5 a.m. your going. time. No, this was oh, the last time. Ago. She was in the States. But yeah, that time. Oh, true. Anyway, none of this matters. Ready to pop? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Dirty pop. Oh! oh dramatic, dramatic pop! pop. <laughs> nice pop indeed. Also, because mm. I knew this would be the most extra episode ever for me, I'm drinking from a, a literal gilded goblet. Oh, no. <laughs> Yep. Oh no. Oh, right. the blood runneth a foul. Oh, that does look very theatrical. I'm going to pour mm-hmm. myself some more bourbon. I'm getting ready for Kentucky. Not there mm. yet, but I've got some Kentucky bourbon. Nice. Kentucky warm on. Uh, uh. I have a bottle right. of dashwood. Just a dash. Mm. Just a dash. Cheers. Oh, see. Cheers. Oh, that's good. What is our background and Probably, dear God, psych for thespian crimes. I can't oh, wait. Okay, so we've done actor crimes in the past, so I was kind of struggling to find like new information. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But if you're interested in like a deep dive into the psychological nuances of a lot of actors, specifically in Los Angeles, mm-hmm. go back and listen to that live episode. Love it. So thespian is both an adjective, meaning related to drama and the theater, and a Uh noun, meaning an actor or actress. Uh Aha. The word stems from the Greek poet named Thespis, who lived in the 6th century BC in Icaria, in Greece, obviously. Mm. He (laughs) He is credited as the inventor of tragedy, like the tragedy, not like... That's too bad. So he's basically the first actor in Greek drama. I love it. Yeah. So Dawson's Greek. Dawson's Greek. He invented Dawson's Greek. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. That would be a funny SNL sketch. Dawson's Greek. (laughs) Just a bunch of people in togas sitting at the end of a dock being crying with like inner monologues. Yeah. And little Caesar haircuts, just like Pacey. But everything else is just Dawson's Creek. Everyone dies in the end. Are you listening, Lorne Michaels? (laughs) (laughs) Joey is still in overalls. Mm -hmm. Oh, she's so precious. I know. So basically, before he came along, plays were entirely choral. They were Mm. all like musicals. The good old days. But like (laughs) operatic and full of music. For someone who loves the play, The Sound of Music, that just sounds boring as fuck to me. Mm. I hate opera, but Uh, I do like musicals sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Thespis introduced elements like the prologue and internal dialogue, which are pretty integral Mm. to a classic tragic play. Mm -hmm. He was... He was basically the first actor in a written play who assumed the resemblance of a character for the purpose of storytelling. So as we know, actors today, he was kind of the first one. Cool. That's a lot of firsts Yeah. Thespis. Yeah. He nailed it. fuck. I mean, he created the genre as we have come to know it, which is pretty fucking badass. Modern Western theater. Yeah. Yeah. There was also an ancient Greek city called Thespia, whose citizens were called Thespians, but they are not connected to what we're discussing here today, except for the fact that both names are derived from the noun Thespis, which means divine inspiration. So it's like how a bunch of kids who are like 12 years old right now are all named Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Every single one. Got it. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. So if you were in high school theater, or maybe your best friend was in high school theater, you understand how seriously a lot of students in particular take their craft. The politics of the theater in the high school are extraordinarily cutthroat. And they maybe even created an identifying accent to just... Annoy the <laughs> fuck out of everybody they interacted with. Mid Atlantic. Oh, you don't say. <laughs> I actually don't remember precisely the Minnetonka theater accent, but it was a thing. It we was all a did. thing. It was. We all meaning none of it you. It was all half singing. Oh, it was incredible. It was that the was most the most obnoxious thing. 
Mm-hmm. I did one show and then I was like, this is fun. I met some new people. I'm, I have other things now. And people were like, but you're, you're in one of this us now. now. You're one of us now. <laughs> <laughs> they were like utterly shocked that I would like be one and done. And I was like, well, I can't fucking sing and everything else is a musical. So like. You also literally just needed it for your resume. Yeah, like everything else you did. Some uh, of us gave our thing. lives to the theater. <laughs> <laughs> Let it go. <laughs> Ooh, carry on. There's something called the Educational Theater Association, which is a national nonprofit with over 135,000 students and professional members. So it's like networking and providing professional development and like recognition and shit like that. They also have Mm -hmm, a division mm -hmm. called the International Thespian Society. (gasps) If. I'm looking it up. I'm joining it. What? If? (laughs) Where high school inductees are known as thespians and middle school inductees are known as junior thespians. Oh, shit. So it's too late. I can't get into it now because I'm 33. I think they should be called thespitos. 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 <laughs> I like that. I know. I it's love cute. it. It just sounds so fucking douchey. There, I said it. I love it. <laughs> if there, I had known this existed, I would have been a member. Uh, there, ha- a there has to be like a chapter at your school. It's they uh, take Lucy, it really seriously. Lucy is like an anti-organizationist. What's the word for that? Where you're just like not into joining any kind of club. <laughs> not I, your, I not don't like your jam. participating. Right. I don't like participating. That's pretty right. much not it. not a team sports kind of gal. No. no. Sure not. Not Mm-mm. sports or, nor teams. Mm-mm. So in this organization, there are like troops and the troops have constitutions and like bylaws. Like... Like I said, they take it really fucking seriously. So, Mm -hmm. you know. Cool. So here's a little bit of psychology here, which Amanda will be able to identify with for sure. I'm so excited. Psychologists who study vocational development believe that your choice of career reflects your personality. Vocational theorist John Holland said that your career reflects some combination of highs and lows on six basic personality types, which are abbreviated as... Riasic. Also, an erectile dysfunction medication. Riasic. Uh-huh. Don't Riasic. take Riasic. Riasic. <laughs> <laughs> it's a twofer. It gets erectile For dysfunction when you're and ready. also acid reflux. <laughs> yes. Oh <laughs> my god. Like killing. Well, you don't. You're not in the mood when you have heartburn. Right. Why has nobody just taken apart like a Viagra capsule and a Prilosec mm-hmm. capsule, poured them into one new little pill, Viasec. and shoved them out into the market? Viasec I will try this. Trademark. Yeah, I'm sure the FDA will be all over that. <laughs> mm, I'm pro Riasec. Continue. So Riasec stands for realistic, investigative, artistic, social, enterprising, and conventional. People. We kind of check all of those boxes in this company. Maybe not investigative. <laughs> <laughs> or conventional. I don't know. We span a lot. Social. <laughs> not realistic. Maybe not even realistic. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We check artistic Two and social. Two of the six. <laughs> Enterprising. I was also sure. going to take this quiz but it asked for like a bunch of like my email and that's that it was going to take 20 minutes. So no. I, did, I just didn't. So people who score high in artistic and low in realistic, for example, might become a professional thespian. Okay. And considering the theater <laughs> is unlike almost any other profession, it takes a special person to excel and thrive in that kind of environment. This is a quote from Psychology Today. Muffet. Oh, you love psychology today. Also, we took quizzes like this our junior and senior year. We probably took Ryasek mm-hmm. unknowingly. That's probably. why we were I've so got horny. A million of those saved somewhere. 
Kenyon mm. made uh, the three of us take personality tests when we started this business. So, oh, I know. Oh, we but took this that is like, investigative and enterprising. But like, we had <laughs> tons of t- moments where we had to take those like professional aptitude tests mm-hmm. leading up to graduation. So I bet we took some shit like this. Uh, there's a billion of these stupid. kinds of bullshit so tests. Dumb. But I love anyway. It. Back to the bullshit. This is from Psychology Today. (laughs) Quote, careers in the professional acting world rarely provide any kind of normal job security. There, there we go. There are always far more people seeking parts than there are roles. The Mm -hmm. harrowing aspects of this demands further comp. I'm sorry. I tried to rearrange my windows so that I could see everything at once and it's not working out for me. So. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> nailing it totally nailing it the harrowing aspects the of its demands f- further complicate the life of a professional actor stage actors must perform consistently in front of large audiences and film actors must be able to withstand the high pressure of the studio often with long hours that can be physically demanding if not exhausting honestly mm-hmm. it doesn't take much to exhaust me so this is not this yeah. is Doing Facebook videos, sitting in a seat, looking at a camera is the most exhausting part of the week. Yeah. It really is. Anything it's being exhausting. on camera is actually kind of tough. It does not mm-hmm. come naturally. We no. have to be present. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I can't be coloring, so I don't Playing love it. Animal Crossing? Playing Best Fiends, which now During... I'm super into. Super yeah. into Best Fiends. Okay. Yeah, well, welcome we'll we'll get to it (laughs) uh okay they may have to spend hours in costume and makeup hello Mm -hmm. we're doing that (laughs) right now (laughs) yep and perform intimate romantic scenes in front of dozens of crew members also hello i've done it tried it not my now (laughs) every week (laughs) dozens of crew the outtakes (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh god <laughs> oh it's a sex scene oh, he's nude Ray. he's nude he is nude <laughs> <laughs> what is happening over there finally the evaluative <laughs> criteria used to judge the actor's work are highly subjective nominations for major awards only recognize the work of very few most actors and only if you've worked for a weinstein picture yeah in oh, the 90s god. basically and, and only, only if, if you're, if you're white and you're a man mm. oh god Uh, Most actors rely on evaluations of their work by drama critics, and unlike most performance reviews by one's boss, you cannot predict the outcome. A negative review can also kill an actor's career completely, so these high-stakes evaluations are even more anxiety-provoking. So again, none of this is for me. It's Hmm. also like, it's both... If you were going to compare it to sports, which obviously I'm well versed in, oh, for fuck's um, sake. here we go. Kenyon's <laughs> one viral tweet being about sports. So I'll fucking never random. understand it. So it fucking was random. So odd. No, but like it's both an individual sport and a team sport because like you can fucking tank your career or tank a movie with your solo performance. Everything else mm-hmm. being excellent. Or mm-hmm. you can tank your career, your performance being quite good, and everything else sh- sucking, or one ass, like the editing really sucking, or, you know, like mm-hmm. the script being terrible. Like, you know, you're relying on other people's work, and it's not like actors have input into, like, what the final director's cut is going to be. Mm-hmm. Nope. Yeah. Scary. Yeah, very scary. That's why I kind of like those, like, behind the scenes. Or, like, okay, so behind the scenes cuts from, like, The Office, where almost everybody mm-hmm. is just improvising. Mm-hmm. Like, I love that it's kind so of thing. so collaborative. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There and are a lot of the cert- actors were writers. Right. Yeah, uh-huh. Which I think is great. Yeah. hmm yeah. Okay. So, again, not something that I'm personally cut out for. And then we can also add in the psychological dangers of method acting. There's a thing mm-hmm. called possession syndrome, where an actor's life outside the theater becomes infected by their roles. Daniel Heath Day Ledger. Lewis. Yeah, yeah, Heath Ledger, too. Mm-hmm. Jim Carrey. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, he when was he did um, Man on the uh, Moon. Yes. Yes, he was like a total nightmare. Yeah. Because he was pretending to be, how am I blanking on every person's name right Andy now? Andy Kaufman. Yes, thank mm-hmm. you. Mm-hmm. Made for a very entertaining documentary after the fact, mm-hmm. though. Mm-hmm. 
Very I cringy. The documentary. <laughs> it's called I'll like watch that. Isn't it called just Jim and Andy? Something. Mm-hmm. I yep. don't know, but it's really good. Yeah. It's so good. Mm-hmm. So yeah, those lines are often blurred. And then last but not least, there was a study done with 214 individuals who were professional actors. And I will just say at the outset, a pool of 214, not that big. So don't take right, not a too big much stock size. in this. But it yeah, it's just curious significant info. though. Yeah. Well, we'll get to it. So these actors were given a personality test and also asked to rate their acting abilities on various scales so they could like break down that data in different ways. Mm-hmm. In general, their scores were higher than average in what is known as cluster B. So there's cluster, cluster, fuck. cluster A, B, and C. So like type A, type B. You will only Hold hear on. about type Most, A. Mostly Bs. But yeah. cluster yep. B is a group of personality disorders marked by inappropriate... Volatile emotionality, narcissism, and often unpredictable behavior. Cluster B. Absolutely. (laughs) One specific disorder. Mostly Bs. Mostly Bs. One specific disorder (laughs) in this cluster is, ironically, histrionic personality disorder. I absolutely have that. A thousand percent. I can tell you without any professional <laughs> diagnosis that I have that. Con- I have that disorder. Inappropriate. the other option. Like A, B, and C? I'm well, definitely A, aren't I? You are absolutely A. Yeah. And Ugh. these people also scored higher for eccentricity and, quote, concern for order and perfection, which makes sense given, you know, their jobs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But yeah. I the, lack uh, some of that, but... You Mostly definitely have B. histrionic personality disorder, among many others, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. 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 But anyway. A lot of, lot of co-occurring issues happening all <laughs> up in here. Yeah. Behind those More beautiful- More wine, anyone? <laughs> You're not the beautiful worst Beautiful fake of them. hair. <laughs> oh, I'm not the worst of them, but I have a lot of them. <laughs> I can name 25 specific people who are worse than you. Here we go. Yeah. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Whip out the yearbook. Donald Trump, Mitch McConnell. I have a list. I have a note in my phone of everyone I hate. <laughs> oh. That's what I'll do while we're recording. That's fine. Oh, that's, okay. That's weird. Anyway, <laughs> shall we hear a word from our sponsor? Let's do yes. it. Yes. I believe in... Self-investment, or as I like Mm -hmm. to call it, treat yourself. Yep. Uh, And I think it's important to reward yourself with premium products that mirror your lifestyle and Mm -hmm. that you use every day and you feel good about using. And that is why I love Native so much. This deodorant is Mm life-changing. Native deodorant doesn't just block odor better, it's actually made better. Like, from the ground up, Native has ingredients that you've heard of and can pronounce, Mm -hmm. such as coconut oil, shea butter, tapioca starch. It's also vegan. It is never tested on Mm -hmm. animals. And did you know that aluminum forms a plug in your sweat glands to keep you from sweating? That, I didn't know that until we started you know doing these ads and that is horrifying it's really scary and that's why native never uses ingredients like aluminum or parabens sulfates or talc and switching to an aluminum free deodorant does not mean that you have to sacrifice on odor protection listen i'm a fragrant Mm -hmm. woman okay Mm -hmm. i'm a sweaty betty and i'm a fragrant woman and i actually i sweat at night i'm a night sweater Mm -hmm. And I never felt comfortable wearing like an antiperspirant deodorant to bed because everything you read about it is like, just use this once a day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But now I'll pop on a little bit of native like in the morning when I get up and then right before I go to bed and it keeps you smelling and feeling fresh all day. And if you're like me, all night long. And they have over 10 cents, including rotating seasonals, which are amazing. Yeah, for summer, one of their seasonal scents that they're releasing is cactus flower and poppy, and mm. I cannot wait to try it. That's going to be amazing. I am a cucumber mint, mm-hmm. like, diehard. Mm-hmm. And Native has something for everyone. So those most popular scents are the coconut and vanilla, which I've also tried. It's really mm-hmm. nice. It's like... 
it's like savory almost. Mm. It's not super sweet. The lavender and rose is beautiful, super floral. Cucumber and mint. I love mm-hmm. that one. It's just an classic. all year round scent. Yeah, classic, super fresh and bright. Um, the citrus and herbal one is amazing. As you know, my favorite, the cucumber mint. Um, and Native is risk free to try. So every product comes with free shipping within the US, plus free 30 day returns and exchanges. Where else can you return or exchange your deodorant? Mm. Like, where? Can't think of any. No. So you can see why so many people love Native and check out their over 14,000 five-star reviews if you don't believe Mm -hmm. us. So do what we did and make the switch to Native today by going to nativedeo.com slash wine crime or use promo code wine crime at checkout and get 20% off your first order. That's nativedeo.com slash wine crime or use promo code wine crime at checkout for 20% off your first order. Treat your pits. Treat them. Are we ready for my case? <laughs> yes. No. It is very sad. What mm. the fuck else is <laughs> in it? Great. I almost drank my candle. <laughs> Should move it away from my wine. You might want to before the end of this case. <laughs> oh, no. Sweet, sweet How many release. cats are killed? No, no cats are affected. Okay, then I'm but fine. It's just sad, and <sighs> it's just sad. It's just tragic. Okay, let's All right, just get well, to it. Band aid. Let's do okay, it then. It yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> it's just so sad. It's just and sad. also it's sad. <laughs> There's a pretty good Law and Order episode based around this. So when I was writing my case, I was like. This is really familiar. Oh God! And then I realized why it was familiar is because I've what seen a Law and Order episode. What if it's just a Law and Order episode <laughs> and it's not real? <laughs> dun dun. Okay. So, um, Adrian <laughs> Shelley was born Adrian Levine in Queens, New York, in 1966, and grew up with her parents and two brothers on Long Island. <laughs> <laughs> I was expecting you're you to keep really going. Good. While I just you're really good. You're too good at it. I couldn't interrupt. <laughs> I've never <laughs> seen a single episode of Law and Order. What? Just huh? Didn't, didn't get me. I like. I Not like even the, SVU. Mm mm. I like the fact-based huh? things. It, they're all fact-based. Yeah, every they're single all based episode on true crime. claims it's not based like on this. a true story, and every single one is based on a true story. Every single one. True. Okay. Also, my mother, next time I get, lo- next time I get the flu, I'll look at them. <laughs> okay. So, Adrian Shelley. Adrian loved performing from a young age. She joined a community theater group at age 10 and made her stage debut in a summer stock production of Annie. Yes. I love that music. Her family was supportive of her passion, but her father always made a point of encouraging her to pursue screenwriting as well as other behind the scenes endeavors. He didn't want her to become famous just for just for acting, saying, quote, I will not have my daughter jumping out a window when she's 30. I mean, he knew that it's he a hard knock hard- life for Annie. It's a hard Adrian. knock life for us. Oh, yeah, Adrian. Sorry. I'm already drunk. Okay. Tragically, <laughs> I was like, I thought that was Newsies. <laughs> so Annie or Newsies? Hard Knock Life is from Annie, not from Newsies. <laughs> is it? Yes. Yes. Oh. Are you? Are you? Okay. <laughs> yeah. No, I told you guys I ate two meals already today. That's not normal. I ate breakfast. You are like afflicted with something yeah, today. Mostly bees. On. Mostly okay. bees. I'm, I'm <laughs> full of bees. Yeah. Bees. Buzzing, singing bees. <laughs> <laughs> so tragically, Adrian's father passed away when she was 12, and she mm. later adopted the stage name Shelley, Adrian Shelley, to honor mm. him because his first name was Sheldon. Oh, I love that. I know. It's very sweet, actually. 
So, Amanda, if you have a stage career, you should be Amanda Michael. I love it. Or Amanda Noel. Mm -hmm. Ooh. So this early loss shaped Adrian's outlook on life, and friends remember her often saying, quote, don't make plans for the future without adding the phrase, however, I might be dead in the next 10 minutes, in which case I shall not attend to it. Okay, well, I love that. How great I don't is that? understand the question, and I will not respond to it. I, I like just that. Lo- I know, I love that too. I might be dead, in which case I probably won't get to it. Mm-hmm. So Adrian enrolled in Boston University to study film production, but dropped out after junior year to audition full time in New York, which was a risky move, but one that paid off. So it wasn't long before she got her big break. In 1989, Adrian was cast as the lead in an independent movie called The Unbelievable Truth, which was a dark comedy about a young woman who turns down acceptance to Harvard to pursue a career as a model, which kind of mirrored yeah, her own that's some, trajectory a little bit. Her art imitating her life, I'll bet. Yes. Um, and then falls in love with a convicted murderer, not her real life. I was like... <gasps> No, I wish. That'd be amazing. That's just exciting. Not factual. (laughs) So this movie was a hit at Sundance and was nominated for a grand jury prize. And then uh, later on, she also had another film that was nominated for a grand jury prize. Like she was crushing it amongst critics. In the following years, Adrienne never quite became a household name, but she worked constantly playing lead roles in dozens of off-Broadway plays, taking small roles in major films, and guest starring on TV shows like Law and Order. Order. Ever heard heard of it? No. And (laughs) Homicide, Life on the Streets. My mom and I loved Homicide. Oh, I don't think I've seen that. Maybe I it have. didn't. It didn't. It it did not over. It was overshadowed by Law and Order for mm-hmm. sure, and their seasons ran pretty concurrently. And Law and mm-hmm. Order like pulled ahead and maintained. Mm, but it. Homicide was quite good. Also, this is the kind of acting career that's like kind of perfect because you're making mm-hmm. decent money, mm-hmm. but not but being you, you a household. Can, you can name. like walk yeah, down the you street. Can still, yeah, you can still go to the corner store and not be recognized, which I think is such like a mm-hmm. sweet spot. You also Mm -hmm. can sign on for, like, a season and be paid for Mm -hmm. a lot more than just, you know, a one-off Well, and these are episodic, which is great. So, like, it's a character. Yeah, Mm -hmm. very Mm -hmm. flexible schedule. I'm here for this. Yeah, yeah. She also frequently worked behind the camera, just like her father always wanted for her. Hell yeah. So she directed her first movie, Sudden Manhattan, in 1996, This was described as a, quote, gently deranged comic thriller, which is like... I'm looking (laughs) this up. My sweet spot. Not to be confused with New York (laughs) Minutes. Not to be confused with exactly what I want from every film. (laughs) I'm literally Googling this right now. If you added corsets, I would only watch this film. Yeah. Um, It was made on a shoestring budget, but it garnered very positive reviews. In <gasps> the whole thing is on YouTube for free. Ooh. Nice. So I watched that later. Just like the last fucking time you did a movie slash. Heavenly <laughs> Creatures. Yes. It, that was for free on YouTube <laughs> as well. And I watched it outside on my patio, like <laughs> nice. on my little side yard. In your like wooded area. Yeah. Ooh, yes. Scary. It was real good. All right, in 1999, she wrote, directed, and acted in a movie called I'll Take You There, um, which went on to win numerous prizes at independent film festivals. And Ali Sheedy, who starred in the movie, said of Adrienne, quote, as you worked with her, you saw she had this ferocious quality. She was not afraid, would not be intimidated, would keep creating no matter what. She was not going to wait around for agents to call or for Hollywood to give her the parts that she wanted. She was going to put on her running shoes and get out there and tell the stories herself, which I just thought was like, uh, 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 so badass. Allie Sheedy being this one, right? In Breakfast Club? I think so. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. The lips. Mm-hmm. Okay. She gets. She mm-hmm. puts on mascara yeah. and like mm-hmm. is really hot all of a sudden. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. 
Um, Tim, oh, I don't know how to last, say his last name, Guinea, Guinea, an actor yeah. who worked Guine. with Adrian. Guinea. Tim Gunn. Tim Gunn. Nay. Yeah. Uh, an actor who worked with Adrian recalls, quote, that she was powerful on the scene in New York. I don't mean that she strutted around with that power, just that her actions were meaningful to people. She was breaking mm. new ground, saying to women, you don't have to fit the mold. Yeah. She, she was just like a fucking badass queen. Mm-hmm. In 2001, Adrian met and fell in well, Met and fell in love with and married the marketing executive named uh, Andy Ostroy, and they, yeah, soon got married, sorry. It was also around this time that she decided to take on her biggest project yet, writing, directing, and acting in the film that you probably have heard of, if not seen, Waitress. I love this movie. And the Broadway adaptation yeah. is so fucking good. Like yeah. the musical and uh, What's-Her-Face wrote like a ton of the music for it. Mm. The that I'm not gonna write you a love song, chick. What's oh. her name? And like that one. she act, yeah, and she like starred in the Broadway production for years. I don't know if she's. Oh, I mean, no I one's doing that. any theater right now, but nice, very okay. good. I haven't seen very the Broadway good. show, but I have seen the movie, but like a million years ago, so I don't remember it that well. Mm-hmm. But like Carrie Russell is perfect. Mm. So her hair is exquisite. Oh, <sighs> okay. So Waitress was a true labor of love for Shelley. She was involved in every detail down to helping design the sets and the costumes. This was like her baby. Mm -hmm. She poured everything she had into it. And to top it all off, she was working on this massive creative endeavor as a new mom. So she literally wrote the screenplay while pregnant with her daughter Sophie Wow. And then when they were filming, she brought the baby with her on set all the time. That's She's amazing. A fucking badass. Yeah. Yeah. And Sophie, little Does baby she die? Sophie. Probably. Sophie's fine. No. But Kenyon's gonna kill off this character for sure. Yeah. Don't oh worry. yeah. It's like She's didn't not a character. Plan She's a real this. Person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is a true crime podcast. Kenyon murdered this Not real woman. Not every crime is murder. <laughs> okay. So, but that so, said, mine's also a murder. Okay. <laughs> Great. Mine's actually a double. Homicide. Oh, okay. Yeah. So little baby Sophie even has a cameo at the end of the film Waitress mm-hmm. as Carrie Russell's daughter. So that's oh. Adrian's daughter. Oh. <laughs> Did you know... That babies have to be at least two weeks old before they can like be on TV or in a movie. That makes well, sense. Well, yeah, that's to why me. not a single newborn on a show is ever an actual newborn. And I have my mother's words in my head every time you see a baby. E- every time you see a baby on film or TV in a room with my mother, she goes, "That's not a newborn baby." <laughs> it's that's because like every I, time it's because they have to have like what's Shots? it called? No, what's that? It's Actors Guild. SAG? It's not SAG. There's some like actors you need, like you have to you you have to be older than two weeks to be on. Well, film. yeah, it's like a it's to like a protective. Yeah, Something. I don't. But you don't have to be part of an an actors union if you don't have lines. I don't. And the baby I don't know it's a, lines, if it's a union, but it's, it's a basically role. like a child protective clause I mean, that, that is now a me. general rule, and it makes perfect sense. But my mom, yeah. every time you're in a room with her watching anything. She will say, if somebody throws up, she'll say, there's throw up in everything. <laughs> and there Why? is. There is. There's throw up in everything. If you want, like, now that you see it, you can't unsee it. What because, do you like, mean everything? Like it's every like, m- movie, Every movie, TV every show? show. Somebody always fucking throws up. And if you think about it, like, how often do you throw up? Well, Amanda throws up all the time. So, I, um, you're diabetic, though. <laughs> I throw up like maybe once a year. Really? You know? I think yeah, when we're on tour that. and we go out and do karaoke, Kenyon's going to throw so up. So twice a year. So yep. uh, I throw up in what? Houston and New Orleans. And New Orleans. Yep. Yeah. And yep, Houston and New Orleans. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I, right. I haven't really noticed fun. this. I thought you meant there's throw up in like in the air we breathe. <laughs> no, she like there's throw up in like I mean, every probably. Probably. Feces, yes. There's poop yeah. everywhere. Oh, yeah. yeah, we all fart. I'm drinking poop right now. Totally. Oh, absolutely. It's yeah. pronounced it's anus. <laughs> it's pronounced anus. 
Okay, so uh, now it takes the real dark turn. Here we go. Oh, good. Here we go. But then at this hugely exciting time for Adrian, both personally and professionally, she's got a new little baby. She's just directed and filmed and starred in her own, like, big, you know, work. Mm -hmm. An incomprehensible, senseless crime shattered everything. Carrie Mm. Russell murdered her. Carrie Russell cut her hair again. Mm. No. I actually liked her short hair. I liked her short hair, too. Yeah, it wasn't terrible. She can pull off any look. I know. She's incredible. Watch the Americans. Okay. Mm -hmm. She was robbed. On (laughs) November 1st, 2006, around- That's what your case should have been. (laughs) Kenyon spinoff podcast is just a (gasps) Carrie Russell fan club called She Was Robbed. She Was was Robbed. Should my spinoff show be called She Was Robbed? And it's just me ranting about people I feel were robbed? It's, It's crime. (laughs) <laughs> it is criminal that she did not win for the Americans. Okay. I mean. So. <laughs> I'd listen. I'd listen. I'm probably going to end up having to edit it, so I'm definitely going to listen. <laughs> You'll listen twice. <laughs> okay. <I'll> listen twice. <laughs> so on November 1st, 2006, around 9.30 a.m., Adrian's husband, Andy, dropped her off at the West Village apartment that she used as her office. But late that afternoon, Andy grew concerned because he hadn't heard from her all day. And this really wasn't normal because even when she was really deep into her writing, she would still check in with him and Sophie Mm -hmm. throughout the day. Sophie was two years old. like She wants pics of her kids. Yeah, she, you know, texts. It's 2006. There's texting. Yeah. Right. So um, he returned to that apartment building around 5.45 p.m. and asked the building's doorman to accompany him upstairs to check on Adrian because he felt like something was... He had a sense. Yeah. That someone was dead. (sighs) They they found her hanging from the bathroom shower curtain rod with a bed sheet around her neck. What? Mm, That was a curveball. Yeah. So the NYPD initially ruled her death a suicide, which was, like, not the right call at all. I'd heard of this incident, Mm -hmm. but did not know the manner in which she had died. Mm -hmm. So this is, like, I didn't know this detail. Like That's really fucking weird. It's awful, and there's a lot more to it. So, yeah. But Andy Ostroy, her husband, was adamant that this didn't make any sense. Well, was the baby there? Or was the baby with the dad? With the dad. I think that it sounds like the baby was with some sort of child care provider because he came alone to the building to pick her up, probably to go back to their apartment at the end of the day. So the the baby baby had been do it. The baby is the baby was not at the office when any of this happened. Um, Yeah, yeah, the baby did not have the physical strength to hang. Okay, I won't go there. Okay, so um, not that like suicide ever really makes sense, quote unquote. But to people from the outside, yeah, right. Or like professional success doesn't weigh into suicide at all. I mean, hello, look at Anthony Bourdain, but. Mm. I mean, she really had no signs or symptoms. Her husband was just like so adamant, like this, this is, she did not commit, or she didn't die from suicide. Sorry if I said mm-hmm. that wrong. Um, so Waitress had recently uh, been finished and was submitted to Sundance and Adrian was anxiously awaiting to hear if it had been accepted and was like waiting to have, you know, other people see it and weigh in. And she was, she'd worked right. so hard on it and she was super excited. Um, plus he insisted she had so, shown no signs of being overwhelmed, no signs of depression. And he, in his words, would never have made the choice to leave Sophie motherless. Mm-hmm. Basically she just, it didn't add up. To it him. didn't add up. Mm-hmm. And that's fair. Yeah. In addition, when Ostroy and the doorman arrived uh, at the apartment to check on her, the door was unlocked, and there appeared to be money missing from her wallet. Mm Mm-hmm. Which, if you, like, died by suicide, how do you explain that? Mm Mm-hmm. 
Because how perfect would the opportunity have to be for an opportunistic person to stumble upon a victim of suicide and then take their money ta- and then take and their money and else. leave? And, and yeah, like that, it doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. That is so, that's a weird fucking detail. Mm-hmm. Ostroy's vocal opposition to the suicide ruling in the days after her death caused the NYPD to reconsider and more carefully examine the crime scene. Also, she's white, so... She's white, she's famous, she's relatively well off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. So the same calls for such action from families of color do not get these results. Correct. quick reminder Mm -hmm. as I drink more wine and hate everything. They then discovered... Key new evidence. When you Mm -hmm. take the time to investigate. When you look. Due diligence. So they just. When you do your fucking job. Mm -hmm. So they discovered a sneaker print on the bathroom's toilet, which they matched to other shoe prints in the building where renovations were being done on the day Mm. of Shelly's death. Dust. Mm -hmm. Dust everywhere. Dust. Mm -hmm. It is dust. Like the hit. Musical dust, not dust. Little cats, Shop of Horrors cats, cats. once said, "We're closed for renovations." Okay, sure. So <laughs> five days. <laughs> uh huh. Mm-hmm. Sure. Maybe. Uh-huh. That's a, Maybe. That's a whole. That's a whole number. <laughs> <laughs> I love drunk men. <laughs> you just become everybody's mom. Drunk uh-huh. soapbox, Amanda. Uh-huh. Yeah. As, as the Show once said. The Long show must pause. go on. As this As the show once, once said. said <laughs> that's not I'm a newborn invent baby. Invent tragedy. <laughs> There's throw up in everything. <laughs> As Thespis once said. <laughs> that's not a real newborn. <laughs> <laughs> I promise I wouldn't get drunk this episode and it's already happening. Oh, You're yeah. already way, on the train. It's way too fun. My goblet runneth over. <laughs> it's way too fun. I'm on goblet three, goblet of fire. Whoa. Goblet nine and three quarters. Yeah. Down Fuck the, J.K. Down Rowling, the gob. but goblet of fire. Okay. So five days after her death on November 6th, Paris. Paris. <laughs> Parisian police. Yep. Paris. <laughs> Manhattan p- police <laughs> arrested Diego Pilco. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Pilco. Pilco. Pilco pump pants. Mm-hmm. A 19-year-old undocumented immigrant from Ecuador who had been one of the construction workers in the building. And I only mention his immigration status because it does play into the case directly. Mm -hmm. And I am Mm -hmm. not in any way trying to paint undocumented immigrants or any immigrants with one brush, but it does. Absolutely not. It does play into his particular motivations, and we will get to it. Mm -hmm. Okay. According to the police, Pilko had confessed to killing Adrian, saying that she had come downstairs to the apartment below hers where work was being done and asked that the construction noise be kept down. And he responded by throwing a hammer at her. What the fuck? Oh my god. It does not sound like the hammer actually hit her or hurt her in any way. But Doesn't it, matter, that's assault. Oh, it's still definitely a fucking assault. Yeah. And it makes sense what follows then after. So then he was fearful that she would complain because he fucking threw a hammer at her. Yeah, maybe maybe chill. Maybe don't. Right. And then he was afraid that her complaint would would escalate beyond him just losing his job and into him getting deported. Yeah, she calls the police. He's mm-hmm. in he's in a rough spot. Hot water. And yep. so Pilko says that he then followed her back to her apartment. She this is all his his account, so like <sighs> we don't know exactly what happened, but this is his account. He follows her back. She slaps him, probably because he's fucking, he's fucking following, following her. her. Yeah. Get the fuck away from me. hmm He pushed her, and then that caused her to hit her head on a table, at which point she became unresponsive. Again, grain of salt. This is his accounting of events. Mm-hmm. He could have just fucking 
hit her, attacked her, yeah. strangled her, or something. Yeah. Um, he then panicked mm-hmm. and staged the hanging to make the death look like a suicide. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. According to the autopsy report, Adrian died of compression to the neck. So if this version of events is true, then she wasn't actually dead when he hanged her. She was just unconscious. Okay. This is all brutal anyway, but that is the- even more. She died during the staging of the cover-up of the crime. Well, yeah. he came up there to kill her. Oh, absolutely, he did. So, Well, he claims not. He claims, you know, and all of this is just, this is the, the fucking offender's recount of events but he claims that it like just kind of snowballed like it was like he was angry he threw it and then he tried to get her to tried to intimidate her into not complaining basically yeah i just and feel like that this is escalated one of those and da, 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 da. yeah it's action outweighing intention maybe he didn't go up there with the plan i'm gonna murder this person but he assaulted her and then followed her Mm -hmm. and continued to escalate the situation, which resulted in her death. I am in no way defending. Yeah, so from where I'm sitting, he went up there to fucking kill her because that was Mm -hmm. always a potential outcome and he continued to Mm -hmm. carry on that action anyway. Mm -hmm. And so I don't, like, fuck this guy. And as far as he knew, she was dead when she hit her head, so. Right. Yeah. And then he covered it up, which is a crime mm-hmm. in and of itself. Mm-hmm. Yep. I completely agree. I'm just. Yeah. 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 You're relaying the possibilities right. of the encounter. And just from like a legal standpoint, like where did the premeditation murder mm-hmm. and premeditation land? It's right. kind exactly. of what I'm and trying to work through. It's a whole through. other ball game. Yeah. Right. Well, we will get to it. So mm. then. Pilko, pretty soon after this confession, gave an entirely different accounting of events. Mm-hmm. In this, he claimed that he noticed Adrian while he was taking a break and then decided to follow her back to her apartment to rob her. All right. Yeah, because the wallet's gone. Right. So now it's almost like he's walking back when, when being asked, like, okay, well, what about the wallet? And mm-hmm. now he's changing his fucking story. Mm-hmm. This whole thing is so weird. Well, that him. would Continue. sort of that would sort of take care of this motivation of murder, of him going into her apartment in the first place. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That might be his thinking. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When she attempted to call the police, he claims he then distri- decided to choke her and then stage the fake suicide. Honestly, both are plausible Mm-hmm. And I think the truth is probably somewhere in between. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think also, like, he, he could just be a creep. Honestly, and was it really sounds like. following her and making her feel uncomfortable. And. It's entirely possible. The first account really sounds like he was trying to lean into, like, an accidental death defense possibly where it's like it got out of hand it escalated i pushed her she fell she hit her head i got scared i tried to cover up this murder and in court that that kind of story can absolutely yield different results in terms of what you're charged with and your sentencing than i followed her into her home or into her office i robbed her and i murdered her Mm -hmm. right right so it's really hard to know exactly what happened but you're you're right it probably is Somewhere in the middle. The facts are definitely he noticed her outside of her apartment. Mm -hmm. Definitely he ended up inside of her apartment unwelcome. Mm -hmm. Definitely he killed her and definitely Mm -hmm. he robbed her. Yep. So So sometimes the easiest way to put the puzzle together is just the easiest way to put the puzzle together. Right. Like those are the things we know of that jury. (laughs) Yeah. Mm. Sloppy. So this account seemed to be more consistent with the evidence, but again, could be somewhere in the middle or, you know, Mm -hmm. everything in between. Ultimately, prosecutors decided not to pursue a first degree murder charge because they worried Mm -hmm. that there would be reasonable doubt with the jury with all these changing stories. 
And it would be really hard to show, like, solid premeditation in this case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, it just would. He probably, like, didn't know who the fuck she was, didn't know her name, like. Right. It's tough to say, pinpoint exactly when the premeditation would have occurred, like Lucy Mm. said. So I can see them not wanting to risk it and get this asshole acquitted. Mm -hmm. So the lack of a clear story also added to the grief of Adrian's family and friends. Yeah, where's the closure? Because there weren't any witnesses to the interaction, and so they, they'll they never know exactly what happened to this day. Mm-hmm. Which, mm. I mean, is so hard. Mm-hmm. That's fucking devastating. So Pilko pled guilty to second-degree murder and was sentenced to 25 years in prison without parole. Mm-hmm. And then he will also be deported to Ecuador upon his release. At the sentencing, Adrian's family spoke in support of the longer sentence. And then speaking about their young daughter, uh, Andy testified, quote, you sentenced that little girl to a lifetime of anguish and sadness and questions and feelings of what could have been. No mm-hmm. sentence would be enough for you. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine? Why do you do this little to toddler? Us? I'm sorry. What's wrong with you? You're a monster. Uh, I am. Yeah, I am. It's hard I own to. It. And it was premeditated because you wrote mm. these notes. I did. Mm. And I saw the Law and Order episode in advance and I still wrote these yep. notes. Mm-hmm. So Pilko responded to the family through a translator, although he does also speak English, but he's more comfortable in Spanish. Mm -hmm. He accepted his sentence and stated, quote, I left my house with the purpose of working, not to hurt anyone, and this is what I deserve. I'm like, you know what, dude? Mm -hmm. It is what you fucking deserve, and it doesn't matter what you set out for that morning, but, like, the second you followed her into her fucking apartment, like, Mm -hmm. fuck you. Game over. Your life can be ruined in a matter of seconds with some really bad Mm -hmm. decisions. and Yeah. Control your fucking anger. Men. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, all men. To mm-hmm. say nothing of the few seconds that it took for her life to end in a violent mm-hmm. way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Waitress was accepted into Sundance and premiered three months after Adrian's murder. Oh, mm-hmm. Jesus. It was an instant hit and went on to huge mainstream success for an indie movie, grossing over $22 million mm-hmm. in the early 2000s. Yeah, my parents took me to see it at the Lagoon in Uptown when mm-hmm. it came out. Yeah, it was a big deal. I remember it. was one of the few places it. it was playing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So good. It has also since been adapted into a Broadway musical, like Amanda said. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Reflecting on Adrienne's life, her husband, Andy, said, quote, I always said to her, your 40s are going to be amazing. Oh, my God, I can't. Oh, Why are you doing she? this to us, Kenyon? Why did you hurt her like this? <laughs> I didn't, I swear. <laughs> You I get kn- 25 years. Yeah. Ah, no parole. <laughs> I knew this film was going to put her in another league. She'd been toiling for 20 years, but through Waitress, it was almost like she was an overnight success again. And you know, that's the tragedy of it, that she's not around to experience the success. Mm-hmm. Or just this like... This is very Michelle McNamara, her, minus like, the murder, I know. but still. Yeah. Yeah. So since Adrian's death, uh, Andy has largely dedicated himself to promoting her legacy. He founded the Adrian Shelley Foundation in her honor, which provides grants and living stipends to women filmmakers, which I thought was Love really it. lovely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He also published a New York Times op-ed in response to Donald Trump's fear-mongering about immigrants during his 2016 campaign, writing that, quote, Adrian was not murdered by an illegal immigrant. Mm -hmm. She fell victim to a depraved killer who simply happened to be an undocumented immigrant. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Oh, good for him to. Yeah. To process through all of this grief and still stand on the on the right side of the issue and speak and use that to to speak out about it. I mean, that is. Yeah. I'm I'm very impressed with that decision on his part. Think about how many fucking killers we feature on this show that are mm-hmm. native born, you know, quote unquote right. Americans. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. it doesn't fucking matter what White your men. status is. <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty it sure Do you guys remember a couple of years ago Molly Tibbetts who was murdered in yeah. Iowa? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. her murderer was also an undocumented immigrant and I 
Mm-hmm. Pretty sure her family did something similar. They That's did good. because Trump was literally using that mm-hmm. case, mm-hmm. it like referencing that case specifically in speeches mm-hmm. to create fear mm-hmm. around immigration. And the family came out directly against him to make a statement. I remember that. And, and Molly immigrants Hurst. actually have lower crime rates than non-immigrant yeah. populations. And Molly mm-hmm. herself was like before she was murdered had a similar sort of viewpoint when it comes to mm-hmm. immigration. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, anyway, it's just sick quote. This is still the, still the quote from Andy. It is an obvious distinction, almost too obvious, but it's an important one to consider as the country goes further down the dangerous path of demonizing those not born here. Mm-hmm. So good for mm-hmm. him. The Adrian Shelley Foundation continues to provide support to women aspiring to be filmmakers, and the body of work Adrian left behind reveals her distinctive style as both an actress and filmmaker, quirky and optimistic, but realistic about the dark side of life with, like, dark sense of humor. Ugh. One, of, one yeah. friend of Adrian's reflects that, quote, she had all the answers. What's painful is that she was one of those sages that all of her friends looked up to. So when she passed away, she left Many lost souls. God. Oh. I'm sorry. I knew it was going to be been a this roll sad. disturbed in a while. I know. I just thought that it was worth telling her story. Totally. Mm-hmm. But it's just really. I'm already having a weird day. I ate breakfast. I flossed. It's, it's yeah. I'm having a weird day. I know. Well. It's going to get worse. Should we get to our sponsors first? Let's do it. Yes. I love it. Top off my fucking wine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I want to talk about a website and app that is honestly changing how I shop. So if you're not like, I don't know, living in like a secluded cave mm-hmm. without Under access to rock. any kind of media. Yeah. A literal rock. You likely know that there is a lot of political and also racial turmoil in our country and around the world right Mm -hmm. now. And one of the many ways that we can be supporting non-white folks and especially black people is to buy from black owned businesses. Mm -hmm. And that is why officialblackwallstreet.com is the fucking best tool to have in your pocket right now as you're making more conscious and intentional buying decisions. This website is amazing. It also has an app, which Kenyon will tell you all about. But you basically pull it out and they have a whole featured page of products of any kind of thing that you need. Any they service, have, any product. Oh my gosh. Esthetician services, grooming products, baby essentials, there's fitness, there's health and wellness, healthcare, jewelry, consulting, food and beverage, like any industry under the sun. And you can use your location to search for businesses in your area that you can become a patron of through their website or in the app. Tell us more about the app, Kenyon. The app is amazing. Basically, you get an alert when you are near a black-owned business that's part of their the you know registry, their, their network, network yeah. that's on their radar. And um, there's like a very easy to use map feature. It has little pinpoints of where all the businesses are. You get the alert. Oh, I love if, a good map. Uh, love a good map. You get the alert if you're mm. near one. Um, you can get directions, business info, images, reviews for each listing. You can also bookmark your favorite businesses and then the app will notify you if they have like new offers and updates. It's great. I love it. So it it just helps you like can easily and conveniently and in an aesthetically pleasing way, put your money Mm -hmm. where your mouth is, you know, like shop from black owned businesses near you, pharmacies, Mm -hmm. restaurants, everything in between. And the app has over uh, a million different users uh, for mm-hmm. both the app and the website. So it's just like really helping black owned businesses gain exposure, gain new customers and, you know, increase their power in the community. I love it. So check it out. Official black wall or download the app on the app store or Google play. All right. Are we ready for my case? <sighs> Is it any worse than Kenyon's? I mean, it's a double. 
It's a twofer. Yeah, prop. I mean, it's their murder. Murder is bad. Okay. Okay. <laughs> You're right. Um, this case is roll famous, oh. and that isn't usually my jam. But like, fuck it. Um, our show obviously does more shallow dives. So for deeper info, there is a My Favorite Murder episode that covers it. Queen Karen covered it in Live at the Grove in Anaheim, which aired November 2nd, 2017. And there's a Dr. Phil episode and a Dateline episode and so many Ooh. dramatic retellings. So there's there's lots out there. And Got here's it. just one more. Great. Uh, today we're talking about Daniel Wozniak who was born on March 23rd, 1984. He grew up in California and spent most of his life in Costa Mesa. The youngest of three boys, he had a promising adolescence, honor roll student, natural performer, interested in the theater. Theater. Spending most of, theater. Huh? The theater. The theater. <laughs> spending most of his free time in school plays where he was often cast in lead roles. I wouldn't know anything about that. So anyway... Daniel Wozniak and I probably would have been friends if we'd gone to the same high school at the same time. I likely would have tried to make out with him at a cast oh, party. Oh, totally. totally. Of the three boys in the family, he seemed to be most likely to be on a college track and go out into the world a success. Without solid plans for his next steps after high school, he took some community college classes and focused on acting. Without a solid plan and a seemingly more vested interest in partying and hooking up with the ladies, like Amanda. he started... Like me. He started to drift <laughs> from his Catholic family. And by the time he met and moved in with a young woman named Rachel Buffett, he, uh, the family barely contacted him. Hmm. So they were essentially estranged. Rachel and Daniel seemed the perfect fit. Two vivacious young thespians with dreams of the stage who cross paths doing community theater. <laughs> it's better than improv. And I say that Pretty as much. someone... Who took an improv Who has done improv. <laughs> yeah. Improv is Did either improv. really good or really terrible, and there's no in between. <laughs> I thought I was good. You were good. <laughs> no one else was good. I gave birth sorry, on stage. CG. Yeah. I can't make a comment because I didn't see it. But I I'm did. sure you were. Kenyon's I'll take dead. Kenyon's word for it. <laughs> so the two quickly fell in love, and Daniel proposed, hashtag proposed Dan, and what would have <laughs> been my high school fairy tale. Some Dan's proposed. Some Dan's do propose, but I i mean, this, Not this all relationship, Dan's. speaking of dodging this relationship, a bullet show, <laughs> <laughs> this relationship ended a, l a little bit worse than mine oh, did, so okay. I'm grateful. All right. Okay. Um, worse so than yours? <laughs> yeah, this had murder. Mine didn't have any murder. So I yeah, know. this is worse. <laughs> Speaking to you so on Valentine's Day. My high school Jay? fairy tale. The engaged couple <laughs> landed roles as leads in the Hunger Arts Theater Company production of Nine, which I have not seen, but I hear it's very good. Oh, I hope that's like seven. It's not. <laughs> but the, but the looming game. wedding. That's a number. Atop his already mounting debts, <laughs> led Daniel into a desperate place. <laughs> He was facing eviction, and the apartment he shared with Rachel, uh, from the apartment he shared with Rachel, he had no savings for the upcoming wedding or the honeymoon that his future wife had hoped for, and he needed to hatch a plan. Mm. Enter stage left, two <laughs> characters. <laughs> Daniel's friend and neighbor, Sam Herr, and Sam's college friend, Julie Kib Kibuishi. Kibishi. I'm sorry, I'm drunk. Um, Sam was 26 and Julie was 23. Sam was a veteran of the Iraq war and the two struck up a friendship while both living in the same Costa Mesa apartment complex. So Sam and Daniel lived in the same building. They were neighbors. They were friends. Sam and Julie were friends because Sam like met her, I think in college after coming back from Iraq and was tutoring her. So they were called, they, so they, they were classmates. Were friends, not romantically together. Nope, not romantically involved. They were just friends, and uh, Sam was Julie's tutor, and they were classmates, and they Got hung it. out. Um, Sam had spoken of his time in Iraq and the financial support that he had received after being released from duty. Daniel knew that Sam was sitting on at least $64,000 in savings from combat pay, so we can all see where this is going. Which, God like, damn, I guess guy. sounds like a lot of money, but, like, if you're just coming back from Iraq and, like, you're a young person, you need to start your life, yeah. you need to pay for college, you need to da-da-da-da, uh -huh. like, it's... It, 
it, it's not like it's a million dollars. Like it's, you know, it's less no. than he probably deserved from having served. Oh, it's absolutely less totally than he deserved. Less, but yeah. Daniel doesn't give a fuck. He just needs some quick cash. So on the night of May 21st, 2010, Daniel lured Sam to the Los Alamitos Theater under the ruse that he needed help moving set pieces and equipment. Sam, without any reason not to trust Daniel, agreed and met him at the space. While up in the attic and bending down to lift a piece of equipment, Daniel came up behind him and shot him point blank in the back of the head. Jesus. Oh. This, yep, just killed him right there. This clearly was not brutal enough as Daniel then methodically removed Sam's head and hands and buried them in a park, leaving his torso and legs in the theater attic. What the? Wha- what? Yup. Why wouldn't you want to get rid of all of it? Right? Well, and that's what, there's so much that I will just never understand. Because he had to prove the death, not just disappearance, because he wanted money. But he also, that that would make sense, but we'll get to it. Why would he, he be entitled to his he money? He wouldn't be. He's not. He's yeah. not. We're going to get to it. Okay. It's a double. We're going to get to it. Oh, right. There's so, another one. no, she's not entitled to his money either. We're going to get to it. <laughs> so he was on he was on time and ready for the stage for a performance of nine that very night with his fiance with Sam's dead body in the attic. That is so seven of him. It's fucked Very up. nine. <laughs> so after the show, he used Sam's cell to text Julie, Sam's friend, pretending to be Sam. He asked Julie to stop by his apartment to talk. Julie, believing it was Sam, agreed and arrived at his apartment late that evening, only to be greeted by Daniel and not Sam. Daniel later said in a statement, quote, Julie was wearing like a crown tiara. She had just come from her brother's. I think there was a party. And I said, like, Sam just called me and he was going through some stuff. She said, yeah, me too. I said, well, I have a key. Let's go in. So he, like, living in the building, anticipating her arrival and friends with Sam at a key to his unit, met, like, waited to meet Julie, knowing she was on her way and, like, plant this seed that, like, oh, Sam's clearly going through something. We should go in and check on him. Oh, no. And then I said, oh, by the way, did you see this in Sam's bed? Lean over. Take a look right there. And when she was leaned over, I put two bullets in the back of her head. So Daniel shot Julie in the head in Sam's apartment and attempted to stage the scene in such a way that people would believe Sam had killed Julie and then went on the run to throw the trail of suspicion off of himself. And then cut off his Except own head and hands. Yeah. Uh, he didn't exactly. he didn't ever want the body to be discovered, which is no, why I, I don't know understand. That. But like if that's the case, don't process. leave the most of it I know. at your theater. It's ridiculous. So, how was Daniel going to get the money after all of this? Enter the next lead character in this tragic saga. Is this the third act? Because that's poor writing. I don't know. I don't know what (laughs) act it is. A 16-year-old boy named Wesley Freilich. Daniel gave the boy Sam's ATM card and PIN number and instructed him to go to different ATMs and withdraw sums of money that he would then deliver back to Daniel. And the boy would, like basically go in costumes so that he sort of looked like Sam. You're not so that be the able ATM to... this fucking moron. You can't It's so stupid. Dip... I know it's you can't it's really take dumb. out sixty four thousand dollars from your ATM. I can't well, even in fucking small log bits. into my small own bits. Gmail without it being fucking four step verification bullshit. I mean this is twenty ten, so a little bit ago, but yes, and he was going to different ATMs and taking out sums and then delivering them back to Daniel. But yes, this is just yeah. another layer of the dumbest fucking plan that's ever this been hatched really by anyone dumb. in history. What is 64 divided by three, which I feel like is a high ATM limit? I mean, there are some ATMs. It's The ATM limit also is not always in because of your bank it's how much money is available in that atm so even if you are allowed within your bank to take out five thousand dollars of cash at a time from an atm Mm. that doesn't mean the atm you go to has that much cash inside of it you might get tapped out at like 200 bucks it's not even it's not even at a time it's within a 24-hour period exactly so like i feel like so it would take him if 
if he could take out $3,000 within a 24-hour period, which is mm-hmm. a lot. Yeah, I have never taken out anywhere near that amount of money It'd from be an ATM. 11, 12 days. Mm-hmm. 21.3 days. Oh, yeah. how did I fuck so that math clearly, up? Clearly, so this bad. is not. <laughs> well, Kenyon had a calculator. I ate breakfast. <laughs> sure did. Yeah, throwing you off. So. <laughs> Um, this went on for several days before police confronted the young man after being alerted to shockingly suspicious activity on the account. Fortunately for investigators, the teenager turned on Daniel immediately and told them what he had been instructed to do. Mm-hmm. In a bit of juicy justice fitting for a murderous thespian, Daniel Wozniak was arrested at his own bachelor party two days before his wedding. Oh my God. The cops show up there and they're like, and everyone thinks they're strippers. They're, strippers. <laughs> and they're like, not strippers. Oh, wait. Oh, I these killed two hurt. people. Oh, I'm not, I'm not into this. This is not a good situation when for me. When do you rip your pants off? Yeah. That doesn't Why don't look these like have Velcro. fur on them? <laughs> I'm confused. So while in custody, he gave several different stories to the police, each one a bigger lie than the next. Um, First saying he didn't know what happened to Sam or Julie, then saying he never saw Julie's body in Sam's apartment, then saying he did see her body and that he saw that she had been shot, just like all Mm -hmm. over the place. So this little transcript is from CBS News. Um it says, quote, the harder they pushed, investigators, the more Wozniak's story changed. He went from saying he never entered Sam's apartment to this. Wozniak, he came down and said, help me. I went upstairs and yes, I saw the goddamn body. Is that what you want to hear? The goddamn body being Julie's. So he's pretending that Sam was alive. Sam asked for help Same. and he went up and saw, the, and saw Julie's body. Wozniak goes on to make his big, biggest mistake yet. Detective Everett says, what did you see? Wozniak saw two gunshots in her head. Uh, Red flag, Smith asked prosecutor Matt Murphy. Yes, beyond red flag. Alarm bells going off, he replied. It was that statement, says Senior Deputy District Attorney Matt Murphy, that put Daniel Wozniak in a whole new category as prime suspect. Yeah, he saw the two gunshots in her head. Mm -hmm. How could you know it was two gunshots to the head? Literally, the next line is, you can't see the bullet holes. What you saw on the back of her head actually was brain matter. That's what you saw, Murphy explained. You can't see bullet holes in the back of her head. She's got hair, presumably. For him to say, well, yeah, I mean, it it was such a mess from two point-blank shots Mm -hmm. that someone stumbling upon that scene, it would be very odd for someone to specifically say, I I saw two bullet holes in the back of her head. Yeah, you would say, I don't know, she was bleeding, she was shot in the head, blah, blah, blah. Right, I mean, it would be like fucking, not to be super over the top, but like, it would be like hamburger. Like, there'd be no way to to figure that out immediately. I mean, that's just not logically where that would go. He also sounds Um, super fucking defensive, where if if this story was true, you'd be so fucking shocked and traumatized, you wouldn't be like, like is that what you want to hear? Like, this guy's a fucking He just sounds like an asshole. Oh, yeah. This guy. Um, So this continues. That's really where it turned, Murphy continued. Detectives now believed he knew more than he was saying, but they still didn't know what. They decided to bring in a Rachel Buffett to see if that would tell them more. Rachel Buffett barely reacted to the news that the man she was set to marry the following day was under arrest for covering up a murder or that her wedding was off. Did she scream at him? Did she cry? Smith asked Detective Jose Morales. No, he replied. Not one time. It was another huge red flag to the detective. And we've talked about this a million times before. Everybody's like uh, trauma response is going to mm-hmm. be different. Mm-hmm. But to to say this response raises red flags, I think is fair. Yeah, if you have no shock. Also, another red flag. Don't fucking have your bachelor party the day before your wedding. It's not mm-hmm. worth it. Don't do it. It was that's two insane. days before, but still, still. that's still mine was with a my hangover. Mine was a year back? and a half before, uh, yeah. and I still wasn't through my hangover from your bachelorette party. Uh, yeah, and I had a Seriously. year and a half to get it done. Seriously, fun. for real. Yeah, hate that. I hate that journey for you. <laughs> so when the two talked on a recorded phone call, Rachel and. Daniel, it was clear she at least knew about one thing, a backpack Daniel had given to her, to his brother, Tim, 
to throw away and get rid of. Mm-mm. So this is a transcript of the, uh, the, the call from prison. Buffett, Tim says he has evidence with him or he knew where it was or something. Wozniak, then I'm doomed. Buffett, do Why you know that? Yup. Have the conversation on a recorded from call. Prison. You Everyone know it's recorded. Everyone knows those calls are recorded. Have you never seen forensic files? Seriously. I know. It's he's so dumb. Okay. Buffett, do you know that Tim do you know that Tim had some evidence? Wozniak, yeah. Oh god. Oh god. Oh god. <laughs> Buffett. This is ridiculous, and I have to go tell the detectives the truth. Good girl. Wozniak, that can't be found. Babe, um, listen to me. I'm going to go do something right now, and you're not going to see me for the rest of your life. Do you understand that? Yeah. Buffett, no, no. Wozniak, I have to tell the truth on what I did, and I think you know what it is, and it's bad. Imagine the worst, and that's what I did. The police did find that backpack, and just as Wozniak Wozniak said, it led to his doom. It had, like, the murder weapon in it. It had, like, personal effects from both victims in it. Yep, replacement clothes. Like, it was was so stupid. It was basically just a little I did it kit that he gave to his brother and wanted him to get rid of. Yeah, exhibits A through Z. Yep, in one cute little package with a bow on it. So finally, Daniel confessed to what he had done to police. Despite his quick arrest and all of this damning recorded evidence and a confession, it took five years for Daniel's case to finally go to trial. Oh my God. Yep. That's egregious. It's really bad. So delays kept happening because of motions from Wozniak's legal team that claimed improper use of jailhouse informants had led to his confession. You know and what? Judges you don't just, even need the jailhouse informants at you this don't. point. This dude is so fucking it was guilty. Recorded. Don't I even know. waste your time. They're, nope. Ugh. And that's just another one of the multitudes of bits of evidence that show mm-hmm. that our justice system is so fucked because judges were just like not moving forward on this case and letting this Mm -hmm. bounce around for years before it was finally established that no evidence pointed to misconduct in the handling of this prosecution. And they probably could have come to that conclusion within the first year of that motion being filed. Mm -hmm. Why it took five and a half years is clearly just lack of due diligence on the, on the part of the judicial system, like lazy judges or judges that look at this guy as like some white guy sitting in prison awaiting a trial and not, a fucking threat to society and just not caring enough to like push forward on it. I mean, it's just, well, I don't care that he wasted five years in prison because like, I don't either. He's fucking guilty. And I hope he gets convicted. But Julia's families. Exactly. The, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. And they were, it was devastating for them because he literally didn't even go to trial for five and a half years after he was arrested. So they're just waiting for this closure. That is Mm -hmm. just, Ticking like a clock through fucking molasses. Like it's just barely moving. Maybe we shouldn't clog up the system with so many nonviolent petty drug offenses or something like that. Yeah, I know, know. right? Weird. Weird. I don't know. It's just a Or maybe (laughs) we should just completely get rid of the prison industrial uh, complex complex and fucking rebuild this entire system from scratch. But anyway, Mm -hmm. um, so finally in 2015, Daniel saw his days in court and was found guilty on December 16th, 2015 on two counts of first degree murder. So they were able to prove premeditation beyond a fucking reasonable doubt, which is good in this Mm -hmm. case. He was sentenced to death. And I feel like it's actually really fucking easy to prove premeditation in cases like this where it's clearly a, a money issue like he thought this through he had an Mm -hmm. end goal he he involved not one victim sam not two victims sam and julie but three victims with this unsuspecting kid that he just like found and sent to a pizza shop atm (laughs) over and over again to deliver him the fucking money Mm -hmm. like he absolutely crafted this and though he did a terrible fucking job premeditation is undeniable in this case so I'm so I've glad they were able to stick first degree a lot of degree. dumb shit for petty amounts of cash in my day uh huh you never if, killed anyone nope and if somebody it's asks you to take out cash repeatedly from an ATM from somebody's don't do card it. don't no that is yeah. a bad news yeah bad idea no mm-hmm. 
So he was sentenced to death and is still, well, was on death row in California for many years, which I didn't remember that they had the death penalty I'm for like a while that- until recently. Okay, okay. But it blew my mind. So I looked into it and confirmed that California Governor Gavin Newsom had instituted a moratorium on the death penalty in California. And more than 700 inmates who were on death row, including Wozniak at that time, are now no longer facing execution. But yeah. still, so he life was sentenced without to death in parole. Yeah. Sh- yeah. Yes. Okay. He was sentenced to death in 2015, but then within like two years of that sentencing, while he was still on death row, basically the death penalty. I don't know if it's been like officially overturned or if it's just like, we're not going to do not this until we can change this law. As for his fiance, Rachel, it remained kind of up in the air how much she knew about this plan for financing their wedding. Oh yeah. Quote, Cause uh, she was like not non plused by it. Yup. <laughs> non plused. Non plused. <laughs> she said, quote, spinoff. Non plused. Non plused. Am I saying it right? She, non-plus. Is it nonplussed? I thought it was nonplussed. <laughs> I've never heard the word plussed in my entire life. Nonplussed. I'll go Where's with that. Ray? That's a fine. Okay. A you find name. your cat and I'll finish up my <laughs> I, game. I've recovered my puss. <laughs> Quote, I'm innocent, she told ABC News in an interview. It was like the person I loved never really existed. Mm. And it was somebody pretending to be somebody they weren't. During the investigation, police gave her a voice stress analyzer test, which is What's basically that? a higher. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> and guilty. <laughs> I want to ha- use this technology on an episode of our show and yeah. just see what happens. <laughs> um, it's basically a higher tech version of a polygraph that can apparently measure whether or not a person is being truthful through voice analysis, which I feel like all of Sketchy, these things, like polygraph. But okay. It's all a little loose, and yeah. I'm not a huge fan, mm. but who knows? It's like um, dental she continued, prints. It's like f- f- tooth prints, like bite marks. Right. Mm-hmm. I would definitely trust that analysis over, like, voice stress analyzer test analysis. But I guess do which think one that- is admissible in court. <laughs> exactly. I know. It's bullshit. I do think the voice stress analysis is interesting when it comes to, like, possible fake 911 calls. Mm-hmm. You know? Oh, things, like, oh I just like, found her at the bottom of yeah. the stairs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> things I think it's usable and it is, has its place. Yeah, things where pers- people are, like, in their own environment initiating mm-hmm. contact. But, like, when somebody's already in police custody, like, even when I'm going through, like, TSA airport security and I have nothing in my bag and I know that. Other than Parmesan and you've got to get it searched. Like asshole, like clenched, like, oh God, what if they find I've never done. Every (laughs) time the dog sniffs me, I'm like, is my backpack full of cocaine? Of course it's not fucking full of cocaine, but is it? I know I didn't pack it. I've never smoked crack in my life, but that always runs through my mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Exactly. So I feel like when somebody's in custody it's a little bit tough because right. like you don't know how they're going to react to that situation. Yeah, and that's why I feel like this use of this technology and lie detector like polygraph mm-hmm. tests are a little sketchy in yeah. terms of yeah. how solid that evidence is. Right. But I, I also and yes and yeah. this bitch totally <laughs> fucking knew what was going on. Yeah. yeah. Um so she continued this denying is- all wrongdoing. Quote the entire testing Entire testing process was very, she was very soft spoken, said Michael Cohen, a now retired Costa Mesa detective who performed the stress test. Her answers were very mumbled and she wouldn't give me a full yes or no answer on the questions. I felt that she was deceptive and not telling us the truth. Mm -hmm. Also, I never trust the cops. So who fucking knows? I never trust a man named Michael Cohen either. Right? (laughs) Get out of here. So two years after Daniel was finally tried, Rachel saw her day in court as well. Um, Brought up on the charge of being an accessory after the fact. So I think that that's reasonable that -hmm. that she didn't know that her fiancé was plotting, like hatching a plan to kill someone for money to fucking finance their wedding. But she definitely knew something was up afterward and withheld information. And the proof is right here in our final 
character, Chris Williams. Final act. Who, oh. Another Chris. Another Chris, Chris Pratt, Chris Who, Pine, the other one. Chris Williams. I don't Another think Chris, this Chris, Chris Williams' character, I don't think, was an actor, <laughs> but who knows. So this was a mutual friend of theirs, and he had come to the apartment to collect on a loan that he had given to Daniel. So he'd loaned Daniel some money. Weird. And on this day in question, he came to the apartment because he needed to be paid. Daniel did not have the money to hand over to him. And Sam was at the apartment hanging out with them the morning that Chris arrived, asking for this money. So Sam was there, Rachel was there, Daniel was there when Chris showed up to ask for this money. That afternoon, Daniel went off with Sam to, like, get the money and came back with money, but not with Sam. And Rachel had withheld this incredibly incriminating detail about the day Sam was murdered. This was the day Sam was killed. Mm -hmm. That somebody showed up wanting to collect on a debt. Daniel and Sam go off to, like, go to the, I guess, go get the money. Or go to get the theater to pick up that stuff. Right. And Mm -hmm. Sam ends up mysteriously... So if Daniel owed somebody some money, like in a private loan scenario, then there Mm -hmm. was more going on than him wanting to pay for his wedding. Oh, no. He was so much in debt that he was facing eviction. Like, he had a Mm -hmm. lot of debts. And I kind of glossed over that in the beginning, but Mm -hmm. it was like existing debts on top of a wedding Mm -hmm. that if if that wedding was happening within the next week, he probably owed on, like, all of the vendors. Mm -hmm. Like, these are things that you schedule ahead of time but don't necessarily need money up front. Mm -hmm. So, like, he was swimming in debt and was about to lose his apartment. And everything. And as I touched on in my segment, acting is, like... Not so, remunerative. Yeah. <laughs> you don't make a lot of money. You can go for Not long stretches without making Santa. any money. Yeah, you don't know when your next gig is. He was yeah. doing like some part time work or whatever, but it certainly not it enough. was not enough. It's two it's two actor community theater actor salaries. Like So I'm assuming because we know where the body parts were hidden, the police recovered all that, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. So once he confessed he uh, led police, like the the body in the ad, the parts of the body in the attic had already been found, but he led police to where he had buried the mm-hmm. other parts of Sam. Part so of like once he can, plea. right, once he mm-hmm. confessed, even before he went to trial, he he gave that information freely. So Rachel was sentenced to two years in jail. At her sentencing hearing, she stated, quote, I hope my silence has not been misinterpreted as callous. I wish I could have saved them. I wish I'd never met Daniel Wozniak. My heart goes out to her and uh, to the her and Kibushi families. They will always be in my thoughts and prayers. So last thing, I'm going to need you to go to the blog slash drive. Finally. Because... I- I got some of the info on this case from a blog called Daniel Wozniak is my friend, question mark. And this is written by a woman who got to know him in jail. And there's a photo of the two of them on the drive and her face is blurred out and her name is not out there. But I was shook because it looks like it could be me. She it has looks blue like hair. you. It looks like it's me. <gasps> oh, no. And Very he upsetting. he has a mullet. Oh, he really does. No. He's not getting any good prison haircuts. So I just not wanted to Amanda. end my case You're by short. setting the record straight. You have the same this part. This is not me. This is not me. Honey. Honey. I know. Is it alarming? I'm going to superimpose your face over the No, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. Oh, I am no. formally telling you that I will sue you if you do that. So please do not do that. <laughs> this is not me. But I'm including the it photo because it's so look, shocking. It really looks like you. If you blurred my face, it would be me. But it's not me. Okay. Anyway, that I is my case. Have it's not believe me. You. Thank you. Kind of so looks much like you and Bill for that case. Stop. A little bit. A little bit. It's not like <laughs> no. you wouldn't go for that daddy if he weren't a killer. And the mullet. Special yeah, fake. You'd, you'd go for a mullet. <laughs> <laughs> I will not be commenting on my sexual attraction to Daniel Wozniak. Okay. Moving on. <laughs> All right. Well, special thanks to our fan picker, Marcella Lunn. You 
won us over, Marcella Lunn. Thank you to Kaylee. Kaylee Kraut. Gonna put some Yum. kraut on my... I almost said a wiener. <laughs> <laughs> well... I load my wiener with some kraut. With consent. With consent. with consent. I love kraut on my wiener. It is July. It is hot dog season. Load them up. Every season... Okay, hot dogs don't have a season. True. Hot dog season Summer. is a year-round endeavor. I love a hot dog anytime, day or night, any season. Christmas Eve, hot dog. I'll say grilled outside on a charcoal grill season. Mm -hmm. If you've never grilled on a balcony in January wearing goggles and a full snowsuit, then you're not a real person. I'm a real Minnesota. Okay. Thank you to Mariah Blake. Me and Mariah, we go back like go back babies like and pacifiers. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your donation. Thank you to Erica. Uh, did I hear Erica that right? You sure did. Let's err on the side of caution. Let's err on the side of ca. <laughs> Thank you for your donation. Thank you, mm -hmm. Felicia Escandon. Hello, Felicia, and welcome to the yeah. coven. <laughs> I don't want to escalate this situation. Not escalated quickly. Ooh. <laughs> Thank you to Ashley Montoya. My name is Inigo. Is it Inigo Montoya? You yeah. killed my father. Prepare to die. Like I bet that. she's never heard that. What? <laughs> Thank oh, you she's never right. Got it. Thank okay. you, Jessica. Oh, Simpson? We Jessica. say Jessica. We do say Jessica to you. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Natalie so. Huff. You won't find us huffing and puffing about your five bucks a month. We love you. Mm -hmm. Sure won't. Thank you to Brett Trace. If you're gonna kill someone, make sure to leave no trace, Brett That's Trace. True. Or we yeah, don't the Daniel torso. Wozniak this situation. We will hot dog roast you if you don't. All mm. right, my third one name only in a row. Thank you, Alyssa. <laughs> I did not do that on purpose. <laughs> I hope I didn't miss uh, anything when I shouted <laughs> you out. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you to Ari Wilfley, who wants to shout out their gateway gal, Amy. Ari, we won't be fleeing from you because mm -hmm. you're so generous. R E S P C T. Mm -hmm. We Will give our love willfully. Will flee means to me. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Thank you to Valerie Pyle Nilawson. I don't want to <laughs> pile on Val Valerie, but Canyon. I'm going to pile on the love for you. <laughs> Oh, Thank you know you. that hemorrhoids are sometimes called piles? It's the yes. grossest okay. thing. In All South right. Africa. I'm so in sorry, In South Africa, Valerie. they're called piles. I, I said hemorrhoids. People didn't know what the fuck I was talking about. Like, you know, okay. the polyps in your asshole. You know. <laughs> you know. Uh, Valerie. <sighs> no, we already did Valerie. Thank you, yeah, Jamie you Tucker. Uh, when you have a lot of piles, <laughs> it's hard to... Tucker. Oh my god. It's true. You gotta you gotta tuck them down. You gotta tuck them back in. <laughs> it's true. You gotta tuck them up. Ish. Tuck Ish. Em. Thank you, Jamie. Holy <laughs> shit. This is a hemorrhoid heavy special thing. <laughs> Turn this ship around. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to Mara Cruz B. I think it's Mari Cruz. Mari Cruz, I'd like to take a cruise with mm -hmm. you, Mari mm. or Mari Cruz. Not actually, Ooh. though, because they are death traps. Death oh. boats, death yeah. boats. On they an open air pontoon in a lake safely in the middle of the country is what For I like. For like 45 minutes. Max. Uh, thank you, Cheyenne Yost. You're the Yost with the most. I'm going to raise a toast to Cheyenne Yost. <laughs> thank you to Tressia O'Shea. Uh, mm. Lucy has a creepy doll named Tressa. Yep. Yes. So you might She's be right her twin, Tressia. Me. Do you maybe two have Tresia. voids for eyes? Yeah, dead, uh, empty <laughs> eyes. <laughs> Just black hole. Are you too haunted? 
Mm. Probably. Thank you to Jesse Barr. Is this your friend? No, that's no. a different one. We, we won't bar you from continuing to contribute to our Patreon <laughs> Oh, page. you're raising the bar. You are mm-hmm. raising the bar. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you to Paulina Gregory. I can only think of food, and now I want polenta. So, mm. Paulina Pockets. Oh, yep. Thank you to Sarah Nolan. Uh, there is... No way to Nolan. Nice no Nolan, yeah. Nice <laughs> Nolan, ya. And there ain't no London high enough. Yeah, did you say ain't no London high enough? She <laughs> sure did. Wasted. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to Amanda ba- Baez. You're the Bay's Nays. You are the Bay's Nays. <laughs> Thank you for your pledge increase. <laughs> Mostly oh, <great>. Bay's. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Dave. Great show on Hulu. Yeah, Weren't you that is a fun show. his maid of honor? I mean, maybe. Maybe <laughs> this is my friend Dave. She was maybe this is one of the other millions man. of Daves. <laughs> I was his best manda. Well, Dave, you're my fave. <laughs> Thank you to Natasha Abbott, who increased their pledge. Um, uh, it's You've about got a time. Good habit going. <laughs> it's, it's a good. It's a good it's ha- about, habit. It's about time you increase your pledge. <laughs> Just kidding. Oh, I get Thank it. you, Natasha. It's your turn now. Yeah, we okay. I had to say it twice, but it's fine. Kicking off our ten dollar <laughs> a month tier. You'll be getting a free fucking patriarchy flexible wine glass, Olivia Doppler, or maybe Doppler. You're fucking Ooh. dope, Olivia. Mm-hmm. The the Doppler effect. I love your mm-hmm. Doppler effect. Thank you to Karina Lindgroth. Ray just Thanks jumped to on the your... back of my chair and scared the fuck out of me. Classic. Thanks to your generosity, or generosity, I can get this growth looked at finally, <laughs> Karina Lynn Growth. I got a Lynn Growth hair. Yep. <laughs> Thank you to Danielle Wilcox. Um, Low hanging fruit, take it. Low hanging fruit, just take, I, it. Just take it. Pluck it, pluck it. it. I cannot. A Wilcox. <laughs> Doesn't like even penis. It's not even it's like, like a fruit. That's just low Cox hanging. Is like a not penis. even like a fruit. Okay, bye. Not even like a fruit. Okay. Thank <laughs> you to Amanda Severda. Sorry for we are so weird today. <laughs> it is mm-hmm. so fucking weird that we can't come up I with a I ate breakfast, pun. so that is so weird. <sighs> yep. Thank you to Beth <laughs> Shelby. Drink your juice, Shelby, no. and thank you for your Beth, donation. I have drank way too much juice. Thank you to <laughs> so Amanda Waterslow. The waters the water are is... low, but the bourbon is high. <laughs> I love it. Too high. Too high. Thank you, Miffy Henley. Oh, We're Miffy. not miffed at you. No. Nothing miffy about you. Mm-hmm. No. Thank you to Stephanie Novak. I say yes, Vac, not mm. Novak. <laughs> Maybe to dry Stephanie Vac. Novak. HVAC. Mm. Thank oh, that you to me. kicking off our trash queen or king or neither or both. We have Gina McKnight. You are McKnight in shining trash. Mm. Thank you, Gina. Yes. And that's because you're on the trash, trash. king or queen or both or neither level, just to make that clear. I mean, maybe you're also trash. I'm trash. There's no shame in it. Mm, It's not nice. Join me. (laughs) Thank you to Kate Hughes. Hughes are such a wonderful person, Kate. Thank you so much. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, Mark Setty. You are setting the bar, Mark. Mm, You're setting us us up. up for Success. You didn't miss the mark on this one, Mark Setti. Thank you to Rachel Brown going down to Brown Town. (laughs) Donating for their big sister, Brittany Watson, soon to be 
a Mrs. Pope. Nope. Keep brown. Go down to brown town. Yeah, Ooh, go down I, to brown I like brown Pope. Mm. Brittany brown Pope. Brown BBP. Pope. I like it. We've never had one. Oh, hey. wait. Brittany was never brown. Oh, yeah. Well, she was always Brittany, Watson. We don't understand. Whatever. Naming conventions. It's fine. Yeah. Brittany Watson, Brittany. please change your last name to brown Pope, please, <laughs> and thank you. Brown Pope. Uh, Brittany had to move her way netting. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> I've always dreamed of a way netting. Her May wedding because of COVID. <laughs> Wait, Vulcan. COVID. I'm so Vulcan. sorry. <laughs> Next. Marriage Next. in way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rachel Moragas. <laughs> uh, wouldn't it be fun if you worked in a morgue, Rachel? <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Thank you would for it? your one soft donation. And thank you to Jess Thurston for your once off of $25 a month. I'm thirsting for you. Thank you to Natalie Larson, who wants to shout out, quote, my girls in quarantine away from me on the east coast. Sorry, I didn't highlight this whole thing. On Keep the going. east coast, there's a second <laughs> line. <laughs> on the east Coast. <laughs> oh my God! This is the last bit. Momo this, Leonard can do this. <laughs> and you. Margaret Ann M A Smith. Can Love you? you, girls, and can't wait for our next anu anal reunion. <laughs> after all, this has been safely lifted, <laughs> and with that, and the east, we take our way <laughs> to the east. And end this episode. I have a joke. No! I have to remember it, though. <laughs> no. You have five oh, seconds I, to I remember, remember it. I remember. Okay, great. Great. So I met a man who said he had an addiction to brake fluid, but he said he could stop anytime he wants to. <laughs> okay, all right. Thank you so much. Bye! <laughs> From the East. Goodbye. Thanks for listening to Wine and Crime. Our cover art is by Kala Yip. Music by Phil Young and Corey Wendell. Editing by Jonathan Camp. Check out our website and blog at wineandcrimepodcast.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at wineandcrimepod. If you have questions, answers, or recommendations to share, email us at wineandcrimepodcast at gmail.com. Episodes are available on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, basically wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Podcasts. And if you like the show, please rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. It is the best way to spread the word. If you'd like to show your support and get a shout out on air, visit our Patreon page to keep this podcast and the wine flowing. Cheers. Is listening to true crime podcasts all the time getting you down, but you just can't stop? Try listening to Bloody Murder. We're an Australian comedy true crime podcast focusing on some of the lesser known murder cases from Australia and around the globe. We use black comedy as a means to tell horrifying true crime stories. But our humour is respectful and never at the expense of victims or their loved ones. We get straight into the case with no banter or chit chat beforehand. That's because the podcast is about true crime, not our most recent manicure. But this frosted French salmon is such a great colour on me. Hmm, is it? Our fresh, well-researched episodes are released every Monday. Bloody Murder has been nominated for four Australian Podcast Awards. We've been going for over three years now. So we have loads of episodes for you to binge. You can listen to Bloody Murder on Spotify and any of your favourite podcatchers. 